Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush. Thank you all. Sit down, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is going to be uh, hysterical. <laughs> Unless, of course, I'm in it. <laughs> uh, I want to thank uh, Gerald and Gail Turner, president of SMU, and uh, love being on your campus. Uh, thank you for your leadership. Mark Langdale and Patty are here, and Karen Prothero uh, uh, on the board of trustees of the Mighty Bush Foundation. Uh, by the way, uh, you being here uh, helps us stay in business, and so we thank your support. Uh, I want to thank Margaret Spellings. Uh, today is her last day. Yeah, that's true. But anyway, uh, <laughs> get the hell out of here. No, anyway, it's a. Uh, <laughs> she. She is. Uh, for those of you who don't know, she's been a spectacular leader here and is off to run the University of North Carolina uh, program, and I appreciate that. Alan Lowe is here. Alan's our uh, curator. Uh, he and his team put together the um, Path to the Presidency exhibit. Uh, I know you all are the first who have seen it. I hope you've enjoyed it. I think it's really interesting. I can't wait to see it myself. <laughs> We, um, uh, Holly Kuzmich, by the way, is acting director. Thank you for being here, Holly, and uh, uh, she's uh, really good at what she does. So, uh, Saturday Night Live. Uh, you know, you probably think that those, uh, when I mangled the English language, <laughs> it was natural. It wasn't. It was to give Saturday Night Live something to put on the air. I can't tell you how long I had to practice misunderestimate. Or strategery. <laughs> Uh, there are two Saturday Night Live writers here tonight, Rob Klein and Edward Kenward. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate your humor. Uh, when I heard that uh, Willie Geist was coming, I was thrilled because, as you know, our daughter Jenna uh, works with Willie on the Today Show, thereby continuing the warm relations with NBC that I have. Uh, Jenna thinks the world of Willie, and I think you're going to find him to be a superb moderator. And we're thrilled he's here, and we want to thank him for taking time. And then Lauren Michaels, the person who thought of Saturday Night Live. What kind of mind thinks of Saturday Night Live? <laughs> he's got to be one unusual dude. Uh, it is uh, uh, part of the path to the presidency has got to include humor. And there's been no more uh, repository of humor political humor than Saturday Night Live. Our nation needs to laugh. Uh, I'm confident the writers are thrilled with what's going on in today's political environment. <laughs> uh, and so with that, it is uh, Laura and I's honor to welcome Willie Geist and Lauren Michaels. Good evening, everyone. Good call and response. We're off to a good start. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mrs. Bush, for hosting us here tonight. Uh, we are here to talk about SNL, but I've also been sent President Bush by the Republican Party to ask you to run for a third term. <laughs> They've been watching the last couple days. 
they're going to make some tweaks to the Constitution and bring you on back. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us, and thank you to this beautiful Senator. Lauren, thank you for being here. Happy to be here. Um, the President referred to it. Um, this campaign season is a target-rich environment. Yeah. Um, is this the kind of presidential campaign you all dream of at SNL? Yeah, no, all we need is for the audience to be paying attention, and then we're, we're okay. When you get a campaign that, uh, where the, you know, the conclusion seems foregone and they're not interested. You're both educating them about what's actually going on and then trying to be funny about it. It's so much easier when they've all seen it and yes. then you're just commenting on it. You know? So the more people are paying attention, John Stewart used to say this about yeah. The Daily Show where people say they get their news from The Daily Show. No, they have to understand the news to laugh yeah. at the jokes. They don't have to understand the news to watch us. Right. <laughs> An added benefit of SNL. So before we go any further, we thought we'd take a quick look back with a montage of great SNL presidential impersonations. Take a look. Good news, he was laughing the whole time. Yeah. Though. That's good. <laughs> okay, we got through it. Uh, so what, what makes a great presidential campaign for you at SNL? Because we talked about the different years. 2012, not as memorable, but you go back to 2008, and you guys had such an impact on what was happening in the culture. What makes for you a good year? I, I think it, it's, it's always the writing, but it's also who's playing who. Uh, if you, if, if who's ever doing it captures some element of truth and, and that rings true, because uh, an impression is, is an exaggeration of whatever traits, but there's something that has to be honest about it, and if you, if you believe that person sort of embodies that, then the writing will, will carry. But if, if the, at the core it isn't working, then you're, you're, <laughs> you're going to have a problem. Uh, and so whatever we're thinking and whatever we've worked out, when it goes in front of a dress rehearsal audience, if it doesn't play, we're just, yeah, well, we, that's not going to work. And there's no arguing. You know, We're in a very clear field. It either gets a laugh or it doesn't. You know, and you can't, you can't explain to the audience that they're not paying enough attention or that this was particularly well observed or that there's a real intelligence <laughs> behind it. it do, if it doesn't play, it doesn't play. So you're sort of both presenting to the audience and also following the audience. We saw the full range from Chevy all the way through to right. President Obama in, in that. Do you remember when Chevy first started this in 75? Yeah, when we were, we were beginning, you know, Chevy made absolutely no effort to look like Gerald Ford, um, <laughs> which was sort of our style then, I think. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't know enough about how you'd do the makeup change or whatever, but um, in one of the early ones, like the third or fourth one, we're just on the air, Chevy had to go for like, five or six seconds without a laugh, which made him anxious. So uh, they were introducing him, and then he immediately sneezed into his tie. <laughs> and I went, really? <laughs> you know, like, you're playing the president of the United States. You know, and I'm Canadian, so it seems to mean more. But <laughs> you kind of looked at it and went, but he captured something. I don't think Gerald Ford fell that often, but he did fall once. <laughs> and w that became the sort of stumbling part of it, and also that that moment of, uh, I, I was told there would be no math, seemed to ring true. You know, there seemed yeah. to be some, something in his look that you thought, I don't do those things, you know, like. Right, uh, right. With, with Danny, seeing Danny in that clip um, playing Carter, Danny's probably 23, 24, and Danny was convinced that he looked older with a mustache, and I was, you know, I went, you put on a mustache when you have to play a mustache. And I, so he plays Carter with a mustache and no one seemed to notice. <laughs> you know? And he played Nixon with a mustache too. And right. You know, and it was just, um, so now, uh, you know, uh, if you're watching sort of Daryl do, do Trump or, or Tina do Sarah Palin, they look like them. And that's sort of more what we do now. Dana captured something uh, of President Bush that was just, it was just sort of magical because he was right. He didn't say not gonna, <laughs> not, <laughs> not gonna, gonna die. die. But all of it seemed to be, and also there was something benign to it. You kind of went, uh, you know, you can't, 
it's much harder to do someone you don't admire. Uh, and if you're trying to editorialize, uh, then something, there's some static and it doesn't really work. So you have to find the way into the character and find a way that m brings it to life and also um, is funny. I was thinking about it today. These presidential impersonations in SNL are such a part of our culture and we, res we expect them right. every campaign season. Were, was this happening before SNL? I know there was a guy who did Nixon on Ed Sullivan. Did you guys invent this genre? No, there, I mean, there were always, there's Vaughn Meter did a, a, an album of the first family with the Kennedys. It's always been impressionist. Um, and there's always been political comedy. I mean, it's, uh, for me, it's one of the great strengths of the country is that we, we make fun of our leaders and we make fun of religion and we make fun of all those things that, uh, are just, they, they're a safety valve. They're the thing that allows us to be a country with, with some kind of level of competence. And, and the more you shut it down and the more, then it just shows up in some other place. Mm. And I, I think that, you know, when I was a boy and I'd watch Bob Hope do jokes about uh, President Eisenhower and how much he golfed, <laughs> um, it seemed that that's what people did. I mean, I don't think it was scathing satire, but uh, it was, in some way, it just meant that the average person could speak out about that in public and just say what they wanted to say, and I think that's a, a real strength of the country. You mentioned the affection that Dana Carvey had for President George H.W. Yeah. Bush, the 41st president. Yeah. President H.W. Bush came back after he left office and did a cold open, and we have a look at that right now. This is 1994. So what's the process of getting a president of the United States, or in that case, a former president of the United States, to come to the show and do something? I think Dana just called him. I think, I think it was just yeah. that simple, uh, and he agreed to do it. We, uh, in 1990, um, Dana and I were part of a, a fundraiser in, at the Kennedy Center for the DLC, and uh, Dana uh, worked at it, and it was Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and, uh, and every major Democrat was there. And then the following morning, we got a phone call uh, from President Bush, could we come to the White House? And we spent about a half hour there, and he couldn't have been more, I mean, gracious and fun, and, and he's funny. I mean, he has a sense of humor, and you sort of saw that interaction, and. Uh, he was just fascinated with Dana then because it was, you could kind of see that he, they, they had a connection and, and he got some essential truth about him. But not all presidents, I imagine, are as flattered by their impersonations. Absolutely not, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Are there other interactions you can share with us between presidents um, and the people who played them? I, I, I it, yeah. <laughs> Let's just say that there, uh, some people are easier to deal with than, than others. I think the more you're, the more the audience, or the, the people, um, as they're called in real life, uh, <laughs> don't sense there's something hidden, that there's some part of you that uh, you're not being honest about, uh, then you're guarding against that, and comedy is naturally going to go for that because that's the truth that isn't being spoken. And I think when, uh, you know, we're the polite version of it. Mm. There are people who just shout things out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we're, you know, we're kind of, uh, you know, comedy on a certain level is polite hostility. You know, it's, you're, you're allowing aggression out in a very polite way, and, and I come from Canada, which is the country of, <laughs> of polite aggression. And it is a way of just speaking, yeah. where you can say what you want to say, and it's within bounds, you know, without, uh, without being rude, or, and also without being uh, unfair. You've had a lot of presidential candidates come on the show. Uh, most recently, Donald Trump hosted the show. President yeah. Obama, or Senator Obama in 2007 yeah. came on. Yeah. Do you find those candidates are eager to get on the show? And when they show up, are they open books? Or do they say, here are things I will do, here are things I won't do? It depends on the polls. Right. 
Uh, if somebody is leading in the polls, they're less likely to come on the show. Um, I think, um, I, I don't think President Clinton was ever on the show. Mm. Um, I think uh, when we're just part of the national conversation, and this year, you know, Hillary Clinton was on, and, and Donald Trump was on, and, and Bernie Sanders was on, uh, because they were, you know, because it just seemed appropriate. If we try, if they, if they weren't part of the conversation, then it would seem shoehorn and partisan. But there, there's a real interest in them, and if there was an interest, then we do it, and we get critis criticized from both sides always. Like, how could you do that? And I go, what are you worried about? Mm. That they'll see something that they haven't seen before and that they're, you know, the more light is better. The more that people get to see people, I mean, and, and I don't know how, when you read the schedules of anybody running for president, you don't know how they're, any of them make it to the end. Just that level of appearance, the amount of, and now uh, a lot of the candidates are doing Twitter feeds which means they're in makeup all day, <laughs> which means that everything that they're doing is public. And in my area, it's just clear that artists need downtime. You need to get away. You have to get off stage in order to make another entrance. And now we're in a time of it's all public all the time. And that, I think, has to be wearing. And sooner or later, what people are, are hoping for, which is what they hope for in reality shows, is something bad happens. Hmm. Some stumble happens, some defining thing that can now be that, you know? And it's not really the best way to judge whether someone's <laughs> qualified uh, or has particularly good judgment. But people are advised now to be out there all the time. Right. And if you say, uh, I really need a nap, or I'd like to work out, or I want to read a book, um, you're in some way letting down the organization. Mm. And uh, I don't think I ever saw President Eisenhower out. You know, he'd throw out the ball at, you know, from third base at opening day. He'd just toss mm -hmm. it into the field. And uh, you kind of go, right, we didn't suffer because of it. But there is a need now. And I, I believe that part of, uh, now I'm going to get grand for a moment, but there's something uh, about uh, majesty. And I think that uh, part of, if you, if you appear all the time and you're on television all the time, and th that's been recently, the last seven or eight years, and maybe longer, the test is if you walk, if you're in an airport and you're walking along and the President of the United States is on the monitor, does everyone stop? Because in, in any big movie, that's the moment where everybody looks up and stops, because it means something important is happening. But people are just rolling their suitcases. And so by appearing all the time, you're feeding this thing that demands, which we work in, um, which demands your attention and demands that. But in truth, it's not necessary. And so it's a question of both ego and also the, the confidence to say, I'm not going out there now. Hmm. And, uh, but it's harder and harder because the implication is you're hiding something. But if we would accept, I think, that if somebody said, I'm just spending a lot of time thinking about this, I think that would be uh, probably a good thing because perspective is part of judgment. I think beyond SNL, though, for a presidential candidate, yeah. is some kind of commentary on your status. You've been asked. You're at the point where you can be on SNL. Yes. So do you have, have you asked candidates who say, no, we're not going to do it, or do they all come on? I think we asked Ben Carson at one point early on, and he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't hear it from him, so I, I'm only saying what, what happened between representatives. But I think, um, and I think Hillary Clinton was go, going to be on the first uh, show of the season in 07, and then uh, at the last minute didn't. And I, I think that was on a certain level ill-advised because I think when you don't, uh, if, if, if it's perceived that you're going to win, uh, we, we, don't, we don't like that. Mm. The audience doesn't like that. 
you got to show up. Yeah. So um, I'm trying to think. I mean, it's it's because of equal time provisions and all that. It's not as easy as you'd think because uh, I think when Trump did it, lots of well, you ran into that this yeah. year. Donald Trump yeah. hosts an entire episode, does yeah. 90 minutes which, or whatever his did 90 time minutes was. of which he's on camera. Something right? 12. 12. Is yeah. that what it was? Which is yeah. So then, how do you manage that? How do you give? George Pataki, his 12 minutes. I think in the states where he was at a certain percentage in the polls, he got 12 minutes, but only in those primary states. And he, had, he just had to do sketch comedy for 12 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> no, he, he delivered a, a message about the country. Um, I, I'm curious, um, we're going to show a clip in just a second of President Obama. There's been talk that it's tough to get at some uh -huh. presidents and easier at others. Um, Ronald Reagan, I know you've said in a strange way, was very difficult could not, to get could to. Could not get it, lay a glove on. Now, why is that? Because the audience knew everything about him. There was no part that you thought, the only one that ever worked, uh, and I, I, I wasn't there for those first four, his first term, but uh, was him being a mastermind, him controlling everything, and that was all going on in the background in this amiable, guy was, was entirely a front because it, in the 80 campaign, they just kept running against him as, you know, he's an actor. You know, he's an actor, you know, and, and with Trump, the argument is he's a reality star. And you go, yeah, so what, we know all that, right. you know, and it's really hard with some people when everything is known to find a way that's original where you got some sense of who they are. Uh, or at least where we're illuminating something. And President Obama, you've said, and I've heard p members of your cast say, there's a challenge to getting him to. Why is that? Because in the first four years, I had Fred Armisen play him. In yep. the second four years, uh, Jay. Uh, it's not, you just can't do it where they, uh, when Dana was doing President Bush, he was doing it all the time because President Bush was on all the time and because, I mean, not all the time, not every day, but, but in that way that he was part of the national conversation. The more that uh, there's nothing happening, you can't just suddenly present him with, and you've got nothing to play with, you know? It, there has to be a story. Do you think about politics at all? Do you think about fairness where people say, Oh, SNL is going easy on the Democrats and tougher on Republicans. I'm sure you hear that all the time. Do you, yeah. Does that enter your mind in how you do sketches and who you cast? Well, I, I think the sort of grand way of, of saying it used to be that you speak truth to power. But I, I think that what, as politics, as cable started to get more and more partisan, the idea that we were not on any side uh, began to look odd. You know, I mean, if you watch MSNBC, you you're already in agreement with it. And if you're watching Fox, you're generally in agreement. And so it, they're not talking to each other except when they're yelling. And we're supposed to be suspicious of anyone in power. That's our job. So we have to find a way in, and we have to do it uh, in a polite way, hmm. you know, uh, and not in a strident way, because no one finds that funny. So what, I think Kate McKinnon's Hillary is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant, and I, I think uh, we haven't, Taryn's done uh, Cruz two or three times, and uh, I think he's got him, but it's hard because they don't know yet. They don't, in a sense, he's on all the time, but they don't really know him. And I don't know why or how it just happens where they know them right away uh, or feel they know him. Uh, versus you just watch them a thousand times and you're not really sure. You know what they say every time, but you don't know who they are. Yeah. And I don't think you trust anyone that you don't believe you know who they are. You know what's interesting about Kate's Hillary? It's so different than Amy Poehler's yeah. Hillary, but yeah. works on a totally different yeah. level. And I think maybe Kristen did it once. I mean, there, there's did been, she do Hillary? oh, Jan Hooks maybe did it. Oh, uh, oh right. Yeah, so right. It, there's different people have different uh, takes on it, yeah. yeah. And this, I mean, we talked. We to never found a way after, after uh, Will did President Bush. We never really. He left, and then we were. He stayed, and we were. Uh, <laughs> uh, if he left with Will, it would have all worked better for all of us. But 
it was just that uh, thing of like, it was so vivid and seemed so right. Uh, and you trusted it. And then, if, uh, you know, Will Forte did it, and he did a perfectly good impression, but it didn't have whatever that other thing is. So it isn't always about accuracy. It's about some other combination of uh, the same sense of humor or a thing that's credible. And then there are these serendipitous moments. One is Sarah Palin is announced as the vice presidential nominee with John McCain. Yeah. And I know the story goes that your doorman said to you, hey, yeah. the new lady looks like Tina Fey. Yeah, what a gift. Yeah. <laughs> is, is what he said. And then I saw somebody else on the street like five minutes later and it was stopped me and went, what a gift, huh? <laughs> I went, same phrase, completely unrelated people. And I talked to Tina that night and she had already been off the show for three years, uh, which no one seemed to notice. And, uh, <laughs> and she was doing 30 Rock and that the only Saturday that they could get Oprah Winfrey for an episode of 30 Rock was that Saturday. Oh. And, uh, Tina said, I can't, you know, I'm doing that, you know, filming with Oprah all day Saturday and, and, and Friday night. And I went, no, yeah, no, you really can't. <laughs> she said, you know, I can do that accent. I could, you know, I think I know how to, yeah. Well, why don't we just keep talking about it? And she came in on Friday night. Uh, Seth and Amy were writing their part of it. And uh, we got the look right. And, uh, and went on, but the audience had already voted for it. In the same way with Bernie Sanders, uh, Larry David was, <laughs> we were, the first debate, we were, uh, I was at dinner with the, ho with the host and the cast, and I got a couple texts from people saying, Larry David is Bernie Sanders, <laughs> and, uh, or Bernie Sanders and Larry David, and, uh, I got back to the office, and the people who were watching the debate in my office said, you know, he, he really is Larry David. And, uh, and then my uh, uh, phone went off, and it was Ari Emanuel who represents Larry David, and he said, Larry David would really like to play Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and a minute later, I was on the phone with Larry, and he said, well, when do you need me? I said, well, come in on Thursday. We haven't written it yet, and that was that. And again, the audience determined it. Uh, whereas I don't think the audience looked at Chevy Chase and went, he should be playing Trump. <laughs> right. That was just nerve. And they know too. It's almost yeah. like their country's calling yeah. them. They have yeah. to go. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, let's take a look at another clip. We mentioned getting in to President Obama. How do you find a way in? One of the ways was in November of 2014 on the president's use of executive action. They went a little schoolhouse rock style. Oh, man. <laughs> Bobby Moynihan as the executive order. Yeah. Um, casting a president, yeah. um, you said you've had Fred Armisen, Jay Farrow doing Obama now. Do you, when you look at auditions, are you thinking about president or is that something that comes after you say that? Well, I mean, you know, there were 17 people in that first Republican debate. Right. You didn't know who it was going to be, <laughs> right. so you, you can't. I, I think it, there are people who have that gift, who, who can do, like Kate can do Hillary and she could also do Justin Bieber. Right. And uh, so that the, whatever that looseness is and, and just finding a way to always get the laugh, that's a different. Uh, so when you have that level of performer around, then it's much easier. And they can generally morph into that person. Um, do you look at like with, when you're having your auditions, do you say, we're going to need a President Obama down the road? Do you think about, is that part of your calculation? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> We're not president by any no, president. No, 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 I'm yeah. just saying it's always at the back of your mind. Yeah. And, uh, and when you settle in, when it's starting to work, then you, you know you've got a long run and you can, you can settle in. And then it's about the writing. And you can't always, you know, we, we, we're not a newspaper, but the metaphor of a front page works for us, which is that you thinking it's gonna be that till Friday and then Friday night it all changes and then you're, you're writing it late Friday night and rehearsing it again on Saturday. So you, if you're going to be topical, you have to, you have, to have a take on it. Mm. You can't just present the event. There are people who say that SNL helps, if not shape presidential campaigns, at least define some of the candidates. Do you believe that's true? Does SNL have that power? Um, I think that we are very, we are 
almost, you know, and only in the world of perception. And how things are perceived is a big part of things, but it is not, you know, there are logistical things like getting people up out of their houses to vote. There's a million organizational things. But I think we can, uh, we can change how someone's perceived sometimes. If there's some essential dishonesty or, or some disconnect or, or somebody uh, that you feel you, as I said earlier, where there's something hidden that you feel this is, this is a false front we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. That you can change the perception of them. Well, one of the one of the most memorable elections, obviously, was 2008 for you guys. Sarah Palin enters the scene yep. um, in August. Tina Fey has to be Sarah Palin. We know that, and Sarah Palin eventually comes on the show. What was that negotiation like? She couldn't have been flattered by Tina Fey's impersonation. Entirely amiable and entirely with time. You know, uh, I'll be there. With it, John McCain uh, had hosted the show right. uh, in 2003, and I, I knew him from another uh, life. And uh, uh, he came on. It's it's one of the that sort of amazing things in American life that you can't uh, can't explain if you don't live in this country. But the the Saturday before the national election. McCain right. came on the show with Tina doing <laughs> Palin, and Cindy McCain came as well. And that was the Saturday before the Tuesday. And so it's, you know, uh, with, you know, what happened in Paris with Charlie Hebdo, where they're killing cartoonists, you mm. kind of think we have it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have a much better uh, world that we get to live in. but. It's a very important thing to be able to laugh at these things. If you can't, uh, I mean, there are, you know, when we, when we responded to the French uh, shooting and and Cecily did spoken French to the the or when the Newtown mass, you can't avoid them, but they're not. You can't be funny about them, but you have to acknowledge them and you have to find a way that you're going to do it that both honors it and the show after 9-11 was that. And you just have to keep going. And that's, and we're part of the keep going. Mm. Never forget that 9-11 show when you broke the ice by saying, is it okay to be funny again? Yeah. To which Mayor Giuliani said. Why start now? Why start now? Um, yeah. I, I, very few jokes that I would take credit for, but that, that was my joke. But, um, <laughs> The, he, uh, the funny thing about it was uh, no one, they'd all been down at Ground Zero. That was the first time anybody had come up. And they walked into the studio, and it was like mm. that thousand-yard stare. And, uh, every, and I, I decided that I was going to start the show with Paul Simon singing The Boxer. And then they came to us, and he was going to speak. And I told him that we were going to do that joke. And he, at dress rehearsal, knowing that he was going to get that laugh, he just started smiling. You know, you're going to, you can't smile. You, you have to say that, and then it's a joke, and then you get the laugh. You can't, <laughs> you can't indicate it beforehand. So on air, if you ever see the clip, I'm like just staring at it, like, just, <laughs> don't, do not smile before you say that line. You know. But he did it brilliantly. Yeah. So let's go back to 2008 right now, October 18th. In fact, Sarah Palin, the famous rap on Weekend Update. <laughs> I, I, I want to point out that Amy Poehler is there nine months pregnant. Right? She had literally nine months pregnant. She had her baby the next week. <laughs> and uh, it's just sort of the way the women on the show have, have operated. There have been lots of babies, and people stay till they really, right. really right. have to they're go. ready. <laughs> That might have induced labor, yeah. actually, rapping with Sarah yeah. Palin. And we uh, had a week left, and I kept saying, can you just hold it in, because we have <laughs> only one more show to the election. <laughs> Don't tell that to yeah. HR, Lauren. That's not good. <laughs> um, yeah. So let's just, we need some behind the scenes of that night. Alec is there. Clearly, uh -huh. he's not voting for the McCain-Palin ticket. We know that. Um, Tina's been doing Sarah Palin for a while. What's, what's the dynamic backstage? What was it like? Well, Alec, of course, 
I said, Alec, you should come in and because uh, we're doing Sir Palin's going to be on. He said, I, I promised that I would introduce a documentary at the Hampton Film Festival, <laughs> and I went, Alec, of course, of course, you promised that you're going to <laughs> uh, introduce a documentary at the Hampton, <laughs> and you, you've always had this sense of timing that. <laughs> More people are going to be watching that have ever watched, and you're going to be, you want to live up to your commitment to, uh, to introduce a documentary. <laughs> that, because there's no one else who could probably do that. That documentary won't go on unless you get to <laughs> say, all right, all right, I'll drive in. So he drove in. Uh, Sarah Palin, that day, Tina was very worried about being photographed with her or in any way looking like she was endorsing her. And so they weren't going to, uh, ever be together, and so we staged it where they sort of crossed like this, like a sort of old Joan Crawford movie where they both mm. look at each other, and it kind of worked that way. Um, but she was uh, wonderful that day. She did, uh, you know, showed up at four o'clock and stayed till one, and uh, pretty much went along with everything that she was asked to do, and was. Super nice to everyone, and uh, and then on the 40th, which was last February, Jerry Seinfeld was doing questions for the audience, mm -hmm. and she she was there, and she thing, and she said, "How much would you pay me if I endorsed Donald Trump?" <laughs> <laughs> well, that was in 14. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so sometimes these things have a, a an afterlife. Did she and Tina ever? Talk backstage? Yeah. They did. Oh, in, in the uh, original? No. In the original? No. They never saw each other. No. And I understood that because she had to play her. Right. And you can't, you have to have some distance. Right. That, at least at the beginning. You, since you brought up that 40th, uh huh. boy, it was a hell of a lot of fun to watch as an SNL fan. Yeah. What was it like for you? I mean, it had to be surreal. In those kind of, you just sort of, uh, for me, I just am watching the thing and I only tend to see the mistakes, so I'm like in that state, and then it's like you just sort of, by the end I sort of figure, oh, it, this is all working, but everyone was sort of pleased to be seeing everyone else, and there's a, a, a nice clip that uh, uh, Bill Simmons found it on, on a piece of, uh, on some clip of the show, where Bill Murray is singing, and Eddie Murphy, who's not going on for another 20 minutes, is down, on the floor watching him, you sort of see his reflection in a makeup mirror. Oh, he's just man. watching him because he's a fan. Yeah. And you kind of saw that each generation sort of was influenced by the generation before and that there's a continuum. And uh, it's sort of what, it's what we do. Do you have any sense, Lauren, for how long this will go on? Or do you think about that at all for you anyway? I always say that there will come a time for me where I can't do it as well as I had done it and where my judgment isn't as clear and, and I'm not as strong physically. And then three years after that, I'll... I'll... <laughs> this man is never leaving, I think is what we just learned. Uh, all right, so this brings us up to modern times, 2016. Another gift, perhaps. Let's take a look at some of the Republican candidates this time around. <laughs> uh, I'm talking to some of your writers earlier about Ben Carson. They're like, yeah, I, we don't know what that is. You just, what's that whole thing? Who knows what that is? Um, so good to see Daryl Hammond back doing Donald Trump. Was that an easy phone call? Like, we need you back, No, we, I, it wasn't even a phone call because he's the announcer on the show now, so it was just walking over. Um, <laughs> that makes it easy. Yeah, I, 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 Daryl is just magical in that character, as he is with Clinton. You can't imagine anyone else doing Clinton now, either. And of course, we didn't imagine that either of them would ever be back. <laughs> <Right>. so, <laughs> so here we are with a Bill Clinton and a Donald Trump. You know, it's like, uh, do you, in your heart of hearts, do you uh -huh. root for certain candidates to win because it'll be good for the show? No. No. I, I root for some to stay in the race. Right. But uh, no, you, you don't want the actual, the person that helps us the most to be president. <laughs> You're a man of principle, country over yeah, show. Exactly. All right, so we've got some questions from the audience. We've got more clips to show you, but want right. to get. We've got this 
amazing overflow room right there. Lauren Michaels is so popular that we had to build an overflow room. Um, there's a crew over there. So let's go to Theodore Ambrose who asks, uh, do you think it is harder or easier to satirize political figures now or in the past? I think because the news cycle is so intense and because they're on everywhere, it's probably easier now, but it, it moves faster. So, um, you know, if, if, if you're doing Trump and he said something, you know, idiotic two days ago and then something else <laughs> the next day, you're in that, you, you can't go back to that one. You have to stay current, so, you know. <laughs> So it's always changing, you know. He does keep us all on our yeah. toes, doesn't he? Yeah. And, and, and what's, so, what's so amazing about him is that he just, he says things that everyone has been educated not to say. <laughs> so he's not in any way inhibited with that. And it's like, uh, you know, the, the, the other night he said, you're a jokester and you're a liar about Rubio and Cruz, you're a jokester and you're a liar. And you kind of go, and everyone's dumbfounded by it because they don't know how to respond to it. You can't say, I'm not a liar, you know, because then you're, you're in the discussion of whether you're a liar or not. So, uh, and you can't say I'm not a jokester, you know, it's just like he, his language is different and they're all kind of off-speed pitches. Right, Yeah. right. He threw Harder in basket that. case too for yeah. Cruz for the first time. Yeah. So He's yeah. got a laundry list of and terms. Whack job. He yeah, really <laughs> right. Whack job. Uh, Clarissa and Anya teamed up for this one. In your opinion, yeah. this is we touched on this a bit. Uh -huh. How did Tina Fey's portrayal of Sarah Palin affect her chances? Was Sarah Palin one of those candidates who was defined in some way by your show? I think in in the same way that strategy had had an effect. I think <laughs> I think that I can see Russia from my house, which of course she didn't say, but it seemed to work. It seemed to be that, what were the qualifications? Well, in terms of foreign policy, she could see Russia from her house because Alaska is so close. But it, it, uh, it just, something I captured. Something, uh, you know, it, it, political cartoons used to do it, you know, pre-television. It's just you're bringing a caricature to life, you know? I still read, I can't, I can see Russia from my house in political pieces as yeah. though it were something she had said. Yeah. And I know Jim Downey yeah. came up with the word strategery. He's very, very upset so. that people yeah. think the president actually said that yeah. when it was Jim Downey who yes. wrote it yes. and Will Farrell who said it. Yeah. Um, Lucy, but he can always use it now as an applause line. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it works. It works. Uh, Lucy Kane asks, do you think SNL lampooning uh, can affect a candidate's poll numbers, how the public foresees them. That's what you just touched on. Fred Garvin says, Fred Garvin. Fred Garvin, male prostitute. Male prostitute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great reference, Fred. Where are you, Fred? <laughs> Show yourself. Yeah. One of the all-time great Dan Aykroyd sketches. Yeah. Um, have you ever had a situation with a political sketch that got you in trouble or elicited a response from that politician or from the White House? Do they ever call and complain? Yeah. Um, they, <laughs> the... the uh, how do those go? Uh, I mean, you know, like, it's all right to feel that it was unfair. Yeah. You know, um, and it's not, again, it's not personal. It's, and, which is why you can't be super close when you're in, in my job. Right. You know, you can't, you can't be part of that. Uh, but I think. Like, who's called you? Who called? Uh, no, I think when we did the, uh, <laughs> we did the Clinton, uh, one of the early things, and they had Chelsea with them, and she was probably 15 or 16. And Al Franken, who's currently in the Senate, um, uh, wrote a piece. We were just m mimicking a piece of uh, uh, a, b a big news clip that had run that week. And I think it was unfair to do Chelsea. You agreed with yeah. them? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it just happened because it was just we were just moving that fast, and then when we saw it, we kind of knew, I mean, it played for whatever that's worth, but it is, there, there are boundaries. And uh, there is a line for you. There is a line, yeah. yeah. Yeah, years ago I was, uh, I was traveling overseas with some fairly educated people, and somebody said, uh, 
that they now watch the show with their kids. Now, for those of us who started it, there was just no one over 30 watching it, so we were doing it entirely for ourselves, and we didn't care about the other, and uh, I didn't have any children, so. Uh, and I came back, and the first show, I did, when we came back, Madonna was on, and uh, uh, Wayne's World. We were doing Wayne's World, and they were, the, they were doing the Truth or Dare right. film, which was out, and she came on board, and there's a, a moment with an Evian bottle uh, it was sort of a famous part of it, uh, which I won't go into. I remember, but, uh, yes. And I watched it at dress, and I went, well, if you're sitting there with your 15-year-old daughter, that's squirm time. You know, you're not, uh, so I went, yeah, well, let's just take that out. And you cut it out. Yeah. But, but only because you want to encourage people sitting there with their children watching it, because generationally you want that that common moment of this is what it was like when we were right. voting, or th this is, you want them paying attention to it. What's the moment for you where the show changed in the new digital age of where, because I'm thinking about watching it the next yeah. day, or kids watching it online. Uh, I think a lot of the Sandberg, obviously the digital shorts, well, that, that sort of ushered in a new era, right? Yeah, and also I think Jimmy Fallon now uses that on The Tonight Show. Yeah. and and. Going viral is a huge part of, uh, of what he does, what we do now, too. Did you get that when Sandberg and those guys were doing that at first? Did you understand why that was going to be important for the show? Well, we'd always done short films right. so and cartoons and all that. It had always been part of the show, and this was sort of a redefinition. The first one or two uh, didn't really play, so we held them. And then Lazy Sunday, which right. was the first... Uh, <laughs> the, the director of it sent it to, uh, uh, I think his brother was working at YouTube, which was a startup, and he sent it and it went viral. Right. And NBC's first response was to sue YouTube. <laughs> and, which is what people always do at that, you know, like we gotta stop that. Right. And, uh, and so that, you could see that that was the beginning of that things had changed. And then Timberlake comes in, does a nice yeah, little was, holiday song. We don't yeah, need to yeah. get into that one. Um, Jerry Sanchez wants to know which president. Jerry Sanchez is also a. No, has no, been, that's Will's company, yeah. Has been the most difficult to impersonate? Obama. Obama. Tougher yeah. than Reagan. Yeah, because you, you could be accurate with Reagan. I think Obama, because of the the way he speaks and the, the sort of, um, it's generally low key and uh, it feels low energy, it often isn't, but it feels that way. And so it's just harder to get it up to a level where you can be getting it and also being funny doing it. Paul Anderson, this is a tough one, 41 yeah. years. Who has been your favorite host and why? Oh. Uh, or give a couple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you sort of, there, there are people, uh, the hardest part for us every week is the monologue. And if it's a movie actor, they have to come out as themselves. And because the show doesn't work if you're not on the side of the host. And that moment when they look into the lens and you're getting a look at them, you can kind of sense their comfort or whether or not there's somebody you want to spend the evening with. And when you get someone like Steve Martin, uh, who's going to show up with seven minutes that's going to just destroy, uh, it's just a much easier week. Because right. you know the show's going to start well. And if we're doing something that's working politically in, at, at the top, in the cold opening, and then the monologue is working, we're good. Yeah, we have the audience at that point. So who else is in that club? Baldwin, probably, right? Baldwin is, uh, yeah. yeah. Alec is brilliant and sort of born for it, and he can kind of play almost anything, yeah. you know? And he'll do Tony Bennett, and you go, he has no right to do Tony <laughs> Bennett. He's really funny doing Tony Bennett. And, um, uh, you know, th there's so many people who are good at it, but you just can't keep... The writing staff and the show in general works better when it's a host that's never done it. Oh, is there's that right? There's just more at stake, yeah. Right. Yeah. How do you, the, I've always wondered the process of picking and approving a host. How do you decide, yes, they're, they're um, very popular right now, they're in the cultural moment, but can they yeah. pull off this really difficult load, the 90-minute show? 
What's the process like for you to say yes? Well, it, if, if you don't believe they're funny and you're going to have to carry them for 12 rounds, it's a different, that's a different consideration. I think most of the time you want, you, you look at the ticket and it's that host and that music and you go, would I, would I stay up for that or would I stay home for that or, and how, what's the interest of it? And, and that's the billboard and you know when you have one where you go, well, Steve Martin and Eric Clapton, well, you yeah. know, I'd rather watch it live. Play. Yeah. Yeah. So there are those, uh, if you knew the, Larry's, uh, the uh, uh, Larry David Bernie Sanders show um, it was a huge rating. And I don't know that either of them are alone a, a huge rating, but it was just that moment of people wanted to see that moment. And I think if you know that something's coming, that you, you don't want to see it the next day. You want to see it then, so you're, because you, everybody's talking about it. And now with social media, uh, when we did that Adam Driver mm -hmm. thing, the uh, uh, the Star Wars thing, right. I think, was it like 50 million? Yeah. 50 million views? Yeah. And it's like, that, that exists now, and also, it exists globally. Right. Like, we have a, a, this other echo effect where the Manchester Guardian's reviewing us. And you go, what do you know about this? <laughs> but uh, it is, uh, and I think for us, uh, uh, that, that this is a part of the American political system, and we're that level of institution that does that, is a thing to brag about. Mm. Is a thing that we do, and it it do, it's not always makes doesn't always make people comfortable, but it's a really healthy sign that uh, there's you know things why are did, alive. Lauren, why do people keep coming back for this show 41 years later? Because the formula is basically the same. Yep. But you find some way to keep it fresh. There's some reason people stay home or stay up at 11:30 on a Saturday. There's some right. reason people on Sunday morning run to their computers to watch. What is it? What is it about the show? Well, um, in my own experience, uh, growing up at the time I grew up in Canada, the, the real enemy of my childhood was boredom. It seemed like absolutely nothing happened. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, a car pulling down the street at night and headlights, you go, well, you know, we'll see how this turns out. Um, so, you know if you're easily bored, if you're someone who's easily bored, you can track like this is too long or that's not working or there's no real excitement or energy to it. And I think particularly on a Saturday night, uh, you want it to have that level of, of stimulation and variety and it can be a musical act that you've never seen before. And a lot of people see music for the first time on, on SNL. And we either do it right at the beginning or after everyone knows the hits, either way is good. Mm. Uh, and sometimes you have to live through an actor they don't know that you think is good. I wouldn't, Justin Timberlake is a perfect example. He was in a boy band. And not that boy bands shouldn't be celebrated, but I think no one knew what he, what he could do. You know, and so when you saw him explode on the air and just be as brilliant and, and funny and, and, and versatile in that, in that way, and there are lots of people that are just, to be in show business probably at any other time than this, you had to sing and dance and be able to do comedy. And the amount of talent you needed to display was just, that was just part of what the job was. But now we're in such a time of specialization, you don't. So when you get to see people doing things that they've always wanted to do and that no one's ever seen them do, you, it, it, it's fun to see that. Let's take a look at one more clip. We saw the Republicans in 2016, now the Democrats. <laughs> the part at the end we didn't see there too is when she pulls out her phone, starts sending emails, and she pulls it away and smacks. No, don't email, don't email. Yeah. Um, let's do another question from Linda Maxwell. How do you decide how many cast members you have for each season? Is there a balance you look there's, for? There's generally someone leaving, and there's, uh, and you sort of can see that there, you know, that there's a hole. You don't have that.
person in that general line of casting. But you're always, every year, you go out and you look and you're trying to find the funniest people you can find. And we bring in probably 20 to 30 and put them on stage and put them on camera. And uh, sometimes you see it, you know, and sometimes they're just good. And we need, we need something more than that. So you're never not looking. And now uh, old cast will say, like uh, Tina fought for Amy to be on the show. Was that right? Yeah. Um, with uh, 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 Bill Hader, uh, well, people call in and uh, say, you should check out so-and-so. Uh, um, I'm trying to think of her name, and I'm not going to think of her name. Okay. What, so when you get in that audition room, what, do you, what are you looking for? Is it different all the time? I've seen some of the audition yeah. tapes. Do you know right away with some of them? I don't think you know right away, but there's a sort of spark to it yeah. uh, when there's a certain kind of confidence. But also you can see somebody that uh, they have to have some level of potential because they're not going to be good right away. And then, and they have to have whatever that not annoying quality is that uh, <laughs> will allow you to live with them until they're good. Right. Because they're all going to get better uh, the more they do it, and there's only just doing it. Yeah. There's no preparation for it. I've heard you say sometimes it takes, what, two, three years for a cast to gel? Yeah. And you're comfortable having that much I'm not, patience? I'm not in any way comfortable <laughs> with it. It's just the, it's the process. It's like you just have to live through it. Later, they say they always liked so-and-so. And I go, mm -hmm. no, you, you didn't. You did not like Bill Murray. <laughs> I, can, I, I can show you evidence of you know, mail and criticism and all that because he came in and he wasn't Chevy Chase. Right. And there's a, a, there's a moment where it turns the corner and people go, I always like that guy. Are there moments like that for you where you're like, eh, I don't know, but I'll trust someone's judgment? And oh, very just, often, very yeah. often. Or someone will come in uh, uh, from the writing staff or from the cast and go, I think we should do so-and-so, or I just work with so-and-so. But there's, there are moments where you need both the event and the moment and the right host, and then suddenly somebody soars and you go, and then they, from that moment on, they're never worried about doing the show. Mm. There has to be that moment where they can do something that they know was magic. And then it's, after that, it's easier. It seems like everybody has a favorite era of SNL, uh -huh. and they always say, the show really went to crap after yeah, yeah. that. And it just happens yeah. to be the time they were watching and they right. loved and it. And it's right? generally the four years they were in high school. <laughs> right, <Yeah>. high school year. Because <laughs> they, when you're in high school, you have the least amount of, of freedom and power. <laughs> Staying up late is like already exciting, and and you don't have any money, you don't, you can't drive, and so getting together with a bunch of friends and staying up late and watching the shows, yeah. And generally, when people say that was the best cast, I almost always could hit it with, with <laughs> if they were in high school. Do you feel though peaks and valleys to the show where oh, you yeah. might lose some huge stars, three or four stars, and you know you're gonna be down for a second? Yeah, I mean, yes. And also, when you're in a valley, you don't know you're in a valley. Mm -hmm. You definitely know when you're at a peak. <laughs> uh, but you just, you're all, there's always something, I'm not being defensive on this, I think that there's always something on the show that's good. Yeah. And you, or that you're proud of, anyway. And, and meanwhile, they're getting better, and the, the audience is attaching to them. You know? Got another question from the audience. This is from John Dean. Have you ever run, have you ever run skits by presidential staff for approval prior to broadcast? No. No. <laughs> you can't do that because we're supposed to be standing on different sides. You can't, you can't go, would you mind if we made a little bit of light fun? No, you can't right. do that. But when a candidate, let's say a candidate comes in, uh -huh. they obviously look at the script and say, I'm not gonna do that. Does that ever oh, happen? Oh, I think that happens all the time, but that yeah. happens with movie stars, with athletes, right. whatever. And remember, we have, on a skill level, on a writing staff, we have people who've been in show business for an hour who have no problem going up to someone and just pitching an idea, which <laughs> is appalling. And they, they come to me and go, am I gonna have to, I go, no, no, you're not gonna, we're gonna read everything and then we'll see what plays. But everyone's allowed to submit and we read 40 to 50 pieces every Wednesday looking for 12 or 13. 
And even that's 20 minutes too long. And so you're always, I, I say this every week, but we don't go on because we're ready, we go on because it's 11.30. Right. So you're just <laughs> always heading towards 11.30 and you know, and you're just, at this point, I'm just wired that way, so you just know we're not there yet, we're not there yet, and then you're gonna cut it off. Don't tell it's anyone. Never, you're never gonna leave going, this one was perfect. Right, right. But then there's next week. Um, before we let you sneak out of here, yeah. do you have a favorite presidential impersonation in all these years? Is there one that really you just love? No, I'm not going to. Uh, uh, he I does, think, and he's not yeah, going to yeah, tell No, him. I'm just trying to think. <laughs> there, there's, uh, I think you can tell when it works. Like, I think Daryl, when he was doing Bill Clinton, but then when Phil Hartman was doing Bill Clinton, it was pretty yeah. good, too, so it's not. And Dana was in a special category. I think Will was in a special category. I, as I said, there, we tried four people after Will. You know, I think Jason did it, Will Forte did it, just, it was uh, impossible. And when we opened the season, we did, uh, and Taron played Trump brilliantly, but then when Trump was on, they wanted Daryl and, uh, and Taron, and you just went, they, they've already voted, they've chosen it, you know? Right. And uh, if somebody else, uh, Kate could have played Sarah Palin, endorsing, but if you can get Tina, they'd much rather see Tina. Gotta have Tina. Yeah. Mr. President, do you have an opinion on your impersonator? <laughs> <laughs> the first one. Yeah, okay. A diplomatic answer from President Bush. Uh, well, we really appreciate the time. It's so, it's so fascinating. And um, and just think, it's only February. The election's not to November, so yeah, it's gonna God be a long knows run, what's yeah. going to happen between now and then. God knows what's happened today or what's happening on Tuesday. So Thank you again, President, Mrs. Bush, and Lauren Michaels. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Willie. We're so thrilled that you were here with us at the Bush Center. We also want to thank the staff at SNL for their help in making tonight possible, especially the writers who've gone to our overflow room, Rob Klein and Eric Enward, who are also here tonight. And thank everybody here for joining us. I hope you'll take time to see the presidential uh, exhibit. If you haven't already, the Path to the Presidency will be doing a lot of engaged programming around here, including hosting Mark McKinnon of Showtime's The Circus on March the 29th, which will be terrific. And the museum and store are open this evening. You can see that and get home in time to watch Saturday Night Live. <laughs> And I'll just close on a note of personal privilege, which as President Bush said, uh, this is my last opportunity to, to visit as the president of the Bush Center, which has been an incredible opportunity. And I have loved leading this amazing staff at the Bush Center, and I thank all of them. And I especially thank President and Mrs. Bush for their fantastic leadership, and you ought to also. So thank you and good night. <laughs>